Good morning. Welcome to the Parkway Church. My name is uh, Jeff Ashley. I serve as one of the pastors here. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll be in verses 1 through 5 as, uh, as Dave just read. And as you turn there, I want to mention something that uh, I saw on Twitter recently. In fact, uh, last week, one of our members uh, tweeted the, this question. I thought it was a brilliant question. And that question is, whatever happened to Salisbury steak? And I thought, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I need to work that into my sermon, so this is my opening illustration, all right? And I'm going to tell you beforehand, it's going to be a stretch, right? They're not all winners, and uh, so I haven't thought about Salisbury steak. Raise your hand if you even know what Salisbury steak is. Yeah, only like half the people in the room, and so I haven't thought about Salisbury steak in, uh, since high school. I graduated from high school 25 years ago. In fact, I don't know if they do 25-year reunions or something, but it would be this year. And, uh, and so speaking of high school lunch, which is what Salisbury steak reminds me of, I want to do a little bit of a survey, all right? And so raise your hand. How many of you brought your own lunch to, uh, to school when you were going to school? Brown baggers, all right? How many of you purchased a lunch at the cafeteria? How many of you were pretentious and you had your parents bring you Chick-fil-A or McDonald's or something like that? I resent you, all right, that whenever I was a kid, I envied and resented you. I was about 50-50 in terms of brown bag and, uh, and buying a school lunch. And, uh, and I remember that buying a school lunch could be a very stressful process. Some days you show up and it's something that you absolutely love, right? You show up and they have chicken strips and gravy, they have nachos, they have pizza, they have tater tots which they serve as a side, but really it's your main course if you're a kid. Uh, or steak fingers, that's another thing that I haven't thought of since, uh, since high school. I've never seen it on a menu since. But other days you show up and they're serving something like creamed turkey or, uh, or mystery meat mush. And then you have to decide between starving to death or eating something that might be meatloaf, but it might not be. By the way, if you happen to be a lunch lady, I apologize for this entire illustration. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your service. Uh, But I thought my options were either starving or eating this mystery meat mush. Uh, And I thought those were my only option until I realized about ninth grade that I actually had a third option. And that third option is I could just purchase 10 ice cream sandwiches for lunch. And uh, and so that was what high school was like for me. Just 3,000 calories of pure frozen sugar before going to calculus or something like that. And so coming to church is a bit like that, uh, th- that school lunch experience that you might have had as a, uh, a kid. At least at Parkway, you know what you're going to get, all right? Last week, we finished chapter four. This week, you don't have to guess. What are we going to be teaching on today? You know we're going to be starting in chapter five. But knowing what you're get, going to get doesn't mean that necessarily you like what you're going to get. If the average Christian... Well, especially the average Christian in America, were making a list of their favorite sermon topics, like what they really wanted to hear about when they came to church. It would be things like how to experience the love of God or uh, practical parenting in an impractical world, some clever title like that, like uh, how to keep the honey in the honeymoon, right? These, uh, these helpful hints for a happy marriage or facing your giants, we love that, or finding your calling. Unfortunately, most of what we just naturally want in a sermon is kind of like what I wanted in a school lunch, right? It's just pure sugar with no nutrition content whatsoever. You enjoy it at the time, but it eventually ends up making you sick. You know what would not be in anyone's list of their favorite sermon topics, what they most wanted to hear about when they came to church? Well, that's church discipline and incest, and that's what our passage (laughs) is about today, which means we need a whole lot of grace if we're going to actually enjoy this text. So let's pray, and then we'll dive in together. I ask you first just to pray for yourself. Just confess, maybe you don't want to hear about this. You don't want to hear about church discipline. You don't want to be here. You're distracted. You're angry. You're bitter. Your wife and you had a fight, whatever it might be. And then will you pray for those around you as well, for God to give us collectively grace to hear and to heed his word this morning. And then will you pray for me as well, just for faithfulness and boldness 
So, Father, we ask this morning that you would incline our hearts to your testimonies and open our eyes, that we would behold wondrous things in your word, that you would unite our hearts to fear your name, that you would satisfy us this morning with your steadfast love. We ask these things because you're good. You've shown your goodness to us in giving us uh, your son, giving us your spirit, and also giving us your scripture. And so we pray that your, uh, your spirit would illuminate us to the truths of your word. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. We'll start in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, which says, It is actually reported that there is sexual morality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. You know, sometimes you're having a conversation and you have something that's really difficult to say, and so you kind of beat around the bush, you kind of wade slowly into that difficult conversation. And then other times you might be compelled to just kind of jump right into the deep end. Well, this seems to be the ladder here. There's no build up, bam, you're just straight to the point. At least it seems like that because of the way that we are preaching through the book. In reality, Paul has actually been wading ever deeper into this topic and slowly building up to this. For the past four chapters, he's pointed out a difference between worldly wisdom and biblical wisdom. He's talked about the importance of the holiness of the church. He's talked about his role uh, in terms of apostolic authority. And then last week we saw that he reminded him. He reminded them of his fatherly love and admonishment towards them. So chapters one through four provide this theological foundation that the subsequent chapters, five through the rest of the book, will be built upon. That this foundation of godly wisdom, the foundation of Paul's loving, his paternal, his apostolic authority uh, over them, and so forth. By the way, this is part of the rationale for why you know, we preach through books of the Bible, so that you can follow along in the context rather than simply jumping in mid-thought and, uh, and hoping to kind of figure it out, kind of like jumping in the middle of a movie and then hoping that you'll pick it up as, uh, as you go. Without knowing chapters one through four, you really can't understand what Paul is saying in chapter five. Your understanding will always be somewhat limited. So think of the un- introductory chapters of the book as corrective lenses, and those corrective lenses will be necessary if we're going to see clearly in order to interpret and understand subsequent chapters. Without those lenses, our perspective, our interpretation is going to be myopic. It's going to be uh, short-sighted. And so you might think of the rest of 1 Corinthians building on the foundation of chapters 1 through 4, kind of like this extended Q&A with uh, the church. For instance, chapter 5 is going to answer the question, what should we think about church discipline? And then chapter 6 answers the question, can I sue a fellow member of the church? And what does God think about sexual sin in the life of a believer? Chapter 7 addresses the question of what should we think about marriage and divorce and remarriage. Uh, And and then later chapters will ask what's the deal with head coverings and can we get drunk during communion? Not that that's a very popular question, but it was a question. How should we uh, view the spiritual gifts? How should we think about our rights and responsibilities? When should we lay those down? What about food sacrifice to idols? What do we do with that? What about gender roles? And on and on we could go. And so here in our text this morning, he's addressing what's not just a hypothetical question, but rather a very real situation in the church at Corinth. And that situation involves sexual morality. The word sexual immorality in the Greek is porneia, from which we get the word pornography. Now, the word porneia is a very broad word. It's kind of a junk drawer term. Anyone have a junk drawer at home? You just throw everything in there, or you might have, uh, instead of just all your miscellaneous knickknacks, you might have just kind of a technological junk drawer. It's where you put all your old chargers and old cords and all phones, just in case blackberries come back or something like that. So you're going to put everything in that one drawer, and that's kind of what porneia is. It's this junk drawer for all kinds of sexual morality. Sexual morality is this general category, and then within that general category, there are various subcategories. There are various types of sexual morality. For instance, adultery or premarital sex, what historically was called fornication or bestiality, or even as our text talks about today, even things like incest. And so basically, any forbidden sexual activity is considered porneia. It's placed under this general category of porneia. And how do you know if something is forbidden or if it's not forbidden? Well, God draws this helpful boundary line for us, and that boundary is called marriage. 
marriage between one man and one woman is the dividing line between sexual activity, which is good and pleasing to God, and that which is wicked and prohibited by God. So marriage is that dividing line between sexual morality and good sexuality uh, experienced within marriage. So porneia, though, sexual morality, is this general term that encompasses all of these subcategories of sexual sin. And notice what the text says next. It's not just any sexual morality, but Paul says it's of a kind that's not tolerated even among pagans. Again, notice that language of kind. Sexual morality is this general category and there are various kinds. And this kind was taboo even among the pagans. What's Paul doing here? Well, this mirrors something that you see throughout the Old Testament where in particular the prophets are going to compare Israel to the surrounding nations and say, Israel, you who are supposed to be the chosen people of God, you who are supposed to be sanctified, you who are supposed to be holy, are no better than the surrounding nations. In fact, in a lot of ways, you're actually worse than the surrounding nations. If even the unholy, the vile, the the gross, the secular pagans don't tolerate this activity, how in the world does the church? He's he's trying to, to shock them and to shame them into repentance. So what kind of sexual morality is so shocking? He says, a man has his father's wife. And all the people said, gross. Now, this isn't probably his biological mother. This isn't some... Freudian Oedipal complex sort of thing. It's most likely his stepmother. Most likely his dad had uh, remarried uh, either from divorce or he was a widower or something like that. And whenever someone would remarry, uh, when a man would remarry in that culture, he would generally marry someone much closer to his children's age than to his own. So this guy's stepmom might have been his, uh, his own age or even younger. Not that that makes that uh, much better. Biological mom, adopted mom, stepmom, mother-in-law, whatever it is, it's all yuck. And it was gross even to the Romans. And the Romans were pretty chill just about sexual, uh, sexual mores in gender, uh, general. But even they didn't think that incest was cool. For instance, Roman jurist Gaius, he comments on the illegality and impropriety of incest, as does Cicero, who uh, expressed disgust at the idea. So that was the Romans. And uh, what about the Jews? Well, within Jewish culture, there was certainly this strong taboo associated with incest. Josephus, the, uh, the, the Jewish historian, he called it, quote, the grossest of sins. And Philo rhetorically asked what form of unholiness could be more impious than this. Again, incest isn't cool. That probably isn't a sentence that you thought you would hear uh, today. Now, some of the, the, uh, our social and even our sexual ta- taboos, some of the, uh, the, the, the sexual prohibitions or, or taboos that we have in our culture today aren't actually authoritative. Some are just grounded in preference or tradition. We talk about all this, uh, we talk about this all the time when we talk about the sufficiency of Scripture. One of the examples that we, uh, we sometimes use is, is this question. We ask this in our membership class all the time. Whether an 80-year-old man who has never been married could marry an 18-year-old woman who has also never been married, right? Just asking the question makes us a little bit uncomfortable, right? He's 80, she's 18. It seems really weird to us. We instantly begin to try to think of these underlying motivations that would make it immoral, that would make it unethical, that would make it wrong or sinful because it's just kind of grody, right? But that aversion that we feel isn't really grounded in an objective biblical standard. There's nothing in Scripture that would say that there's something wrong inherently with it. Maybe he's kind of a creeper. Maybe she's a gold digger. And that might be true, but then the problem would not be the marriage in and of itself. The problem would be the underlying greed or fraud or whatever it might be and not the marriage in and of itself. So here's the question. Is incest just like that? Is it something that we're just uncomfortable with because of some sort of subjective cultural taboo Or is it actually grounded in an objective standard? And the answer is, it's not something that's just subjective and cultural. Beginning with the Old Testament, we see a clear prohibition. For example, Leviticus 18.8, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It It is your father's nakedness. By the way, the previous verse, we're not going to read it for the sake of time, but the previous verse in Leviticus 18 talks about uncovering your mother 
as well. So this is partly why scholars think 1 Corinthians here is talking not about his biological mom, but his stepmom. Verse 7 of Leviticus 18 talks about your mother, and then verse 8 talks about your father's wife as if those things are different. So the phrase father's wife in the Old Testament typically wasn't used of your biological mother, but rather of a stepmother. Leviticus 20.11, if a man lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. But that's the Old Testament. What about in the New Testament? Well, you wouldn't expect there to be much need for uh, explicit commentary given the fact that Jewish tradition and even Roman tradition were so opposed to it. However, bear in mind that Paul has already put this into the sexual morality junk drawer. He's already done that. He's already explicitly called this porneia. So it's clear that the topic of incest isn't just gross on the basis of some sort of cultural standard or some sort of uh, subjective taboo. It's objectively sinful. Now, I'm not convincing anybody in this room. There's nobody that walked into this room that thought incest is good, uh, but now my mind's changed or something like that. And 70 years ago, if I were preaching this exact same passage, I probably wouldn't have spent five minutes trying to show you that incest is objectively bad. But the problem is this isn't 70 years ago. This isn't the 1950s. In fact, it isn't even the 90s. In fact, our, our world, the world that we live in today is radically different today than it was even 10 years ago when it comes to sexual norms and mores in our society. Even in the church, unfortunately, many churches have capitulated on sexuality. Millennia of sexual norms and traditions have been dismantled overnight. Just think in the past generation, just the past generation. So your lifetime or the lifetime of your parents at the most, think of all of the changes. So 50 years ago, we had the introduction of no-fault uh, divorce laws that helped to destigmatize and to normalize divorce. And around that same time, you have the birth control pill. And then a couple of, uh, of decades later, you have uh, the legalization of abortion. All of those things help to normalize and destigmatize fornication or premarital sex. And then think about just the past 10 years, how this snowball has begun to pick up steam, uh, which is a mixed metaphor. But anyway, in the past 10 years, we've seen this complete cultural reinterpretation on things like transgenderism and homosexuality. What was once on the fringes of society, what was uh, once uh, marginalized, has now been uh, centered and normalized. So homosexuality, transgenderism, uh, premarital sex, all of these things are not only accepted, but they're now celebrated. In fact, if you don't accept them in our society, you'll find yourself to be ostracized, yourself to be canceled, yourself to be marginalized. And for the time being, incest remains one of the few final remaining cultural taboos as it relates to sex. And I say that a phrase for the time being because even right now, there's an actual legal fight in New York where a parent wants to legally wed their adult child. And here's the scary thing. I don't see any logical reason from culture's perspective to actually oppose it. Once you've already completely redefined uh, uh, marriage and made it more about uh, some sort of subjective happiness or subjective feeling, uh, then I don't see how any sort of law against incest will ultimately remain standing for much longer. Once you make sexual norms to be subjective, you lose the ability to create these objective boundaries. So that's why it's important that we not just assume that everyone agrees already that incest or homosexuality or transgenderism or whatever it is, is wrong, but that we actually go through the work of explaining the biblical, the theological rationale for those prohibitions. Yes, it's awkward. It's kind of like having the talk with your parents or something like that, but it's necessary if the, if the church is going to remain tethered to the truth because whatever one generation simply assumes Without teaching explicitly, the next generation will eventually forget. You see that throughout church history. This is part of what modern evangelicalism is reaping today. Our culture has long since capitulated on this issue, and so we're just beginning to taste it in the church today. By the way, if you want to know why our culture has relatively recently redefined and, and fixated on sexuality, uh, 
I would encourage you to go and listen to, we, we taught on sexuality twice in theological equipping over the past uh, year or so. And then I'd also encourage you to read a book. It's called uh, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman. It's hands down the best book that I read uh, last year. In fact, in five years at, uh, at Parkway, it's the first book that I've ever purchased for all of the staff and all of the elders to read uh, together. So if you want to know why what was previously chastised is today celebrated, Carl Truman's The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self is the book uh, to get. I couldn't more highly recommend that to you. It's a hard read, but it's very important. So that's the context. Now, this sermon thankfully isn't really about uh, incest in particular. It isn't really even about sexual morality in general. Yes, that's certainly a problem, but there's an even bigger problem from Paul's perspective, and that's the church's response to this problem. And let's take a look at that. 1 Corinthians 5.2. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let the one who has done this be removed from among you. So there is this egregious biblically prohibited, even culturally rejected sexual sin among the Corinthians, and what is their response? Their response is arrogance. This kind of reminds me of watching a football game, game and some team, typically the Cowboys, are down by like 30 in the fourth quarter, and then all of a sudden this the d- defensive end will get a sack, and he'll jump up and he'll start celebrating, and I'm like, what are you doing? You're getting massacred, and here you are celebrating a simple sack or something like that. That's what I feel like the Corinthians are doing. They're boasting when they should be mourning. They're arrogant rather than repentance. Now, arrogance is a big theme in 1 Corinthians. It's a big theme, especially in the immediate context. We saw this last week, 1 Corinthians 4, 18 through 19. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. This is not just in the immediate context, though. The entire book is, uh, is a response to the arrogance of the Corinthians. This will be a common refrain that we'll encounter throughout this particular book. From beginning to end, the Corinthians are walking in pride. They're proud of their eloquence and worldly wisdom, as we've seen. As we will see, they're proud of their spiritual gifts. They're proud of their freedom. They're proud of their rights, etc., So how are the Corinthians being arrogant here in chapter five? By failing to rebuke and correct this man. By the way, just as an aside, what's the most common critique that you'll hear from culture if you hold to an actual biblical, theologically consistent worldview when it comes to sex or gender or whatever it might be? You'll be called intolerant, you'll be called bigoted, you'll be called proud, you'll be called arrogant. Even among Christians, when you rebuke someone, when you correct someone, they'll call you proud, they'll call you arrogant. Yet according to 1 Corinthians 5, notice the exact opposite is actually true. It's not those who rebuke the sinner who are arrogant, rather it's those who tolerate the sin. It isn't arrogant to submit to God's word, it's arrogant to reject God's word. This is something we've talked about before. It's called equivocation. But the world loves to take this biblical word or concept and then redefine it by its worldly standards. And that's just a Trojan horse. It's a trap. Whether it's, in, whether it's a word like tolerance or judgment or love or grace or arrogance, whatever it might be, culture simply redefines a word in a way that actually contradicts the biblical meaning of that word. So back to 1 Corinthians. We don't know why the Corinthians aren't rebuking this man. And there are at least two possible reasons. The first is theological. The second is sociological. The theological reason, you might think about it as they are boasting in their sin. They're they're boasting because of the sin. And the sociological reason is that they're boasting in spite of the sin. All right? So theological, they're boasting in their sin or because of the sin. The sociological reason is that they are boasting in spite of sin. The sin. I'll explain both of those. So one interpretation of this that's a historically common interpretation is that the Corinthians are boasting because of their sin. There's a theological explanation behind this. They're boasting in the sin. That, as we'll see later in the book, that the Corinthians uh, seem to be boasting in saying phrases like, all things are lawful. We'll get to that uh, shortly. Uh, but they seem to be boasting in this idea, similar to where Romans says that some are claiming uh, that you should sin all the more so that grace may abound. 
And so some people interpret this as saying that the Corinthians are, are in essentially saying we're so enlightened, we're so gospel-centered, we so understand grace that sexual ethics no longer apply to us. They apply to others, but not to us. We're too enlightened. We're not going to correct this man. We're instead going to celebrate the fact that he is so uh, under the gospel that he is sexually liberated, liberated. And I think that's going on in the context, but, but that's not all. We'll see that theological issue a few times over the next few weeks, so I won't spend as much time on it now. Rather, I want to bring out another potential nuance, a sociological reason for their refusal to rebuke. In other words, I think there is some cultural factor that makes the Corinthians hesitant to rebuke and correct this man. For instance, perhaps he's a man of means. Perhaps he's a man of wealth or he's a man of status. Maybe he's an elder or teacher in the church. You have to remember the context that esteem, that glory, that wealth, these kinds of things, this is the narcotic of Corinthian culture. They're all about status. They're all about esteem. They're all about glory. They're all about wealth and so forth. So maybe this is a highly significant man, and so there's a hesitancy to rebuke him for these sociological sort of reasons. And I kind of get that. For instance, let's imagine for a second that Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, was a member at Parkway. All right, why is that significant? Well, he's worth $200 billion, right? I don't think anyone here is worth $200 billion because Jeff Bezos is the most wealthy man in the world. And so let's imagine that he's a member here and let's imagine that he just simply puts it uh, in, in the stock market or something like that, and he makes 10% a year in interest. That's 200, I'm sorry, that's $20 billion a year. And now let's assume that he tithes. We're no longer under the tithe, we just have to give. But let's assume that he is a tither. And so that's $2 billion a year, which is roughly $5.5 million a day. That's twice what we pay Tim in a year. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right, it's half what we pay him. All right, now let's assume that Jeff Bezos is a member here and let's assume that he's engaged in some sort of egregious sin. Think about that for a second. You can imagine the intense pressure to sweep it under the rug, at least for a few days, right? If you can just wait it out a week, that's 35 more million dollars, right? There's a whole lot of pressure, a whole lot of temptation. And this isn't just a temptation that our elders would face or our paid staff would face. Our members would face it too. You would face it as well. If he were giving, we could probably afford to keep this room warmer than 45 degrees or whatever it is in here. <laughs> Think of all the heated massage chairs. Everybody could have their own, right? You could have free prime membership, and that's just the beginning. <laughs> right? He could, he could build a kid's water park that would make Schlitterbahn look like an old out-of-order splash pad. Imagine how much your kids would love Jesus. They'd love church. If only they had a lazy river. All right? Or on a serious note, think of all of the benevolence that we could do. Think of all the outreach programs. Think about all the missions that we could do. Think of all the people that we could help, all, all the medical debt that we could cancel, whatever it might be. There's this huge social pressure to just kind of leave him be and let the sin continue. That's why I like thinking about this sociological perspective because I think we can all relate to it. We can all imagine some sort of scenario in which we might be tempted to avoid this awkward confrontation. Maybe it's because of wealth, but maybe also it's just because of some sort of relationship. We don't want to rebuke a fellow believer because he's our boss, maybe, or he's our husband, or she's our wife, or our mother-in-law, or our sibling, or a neighbor, whatever it is. There's these innate social pressures to keep the peace rather than actually making the peace by faithful correction in love. And at the end of the day, we don't really know exactly what was happening in the minds and in the hearts of the Corinthians. We don't know exactly why they weren't being faithful by rebuking this man. We just know that they weren't. They were evidencing this calloused indifference to his sin. But Paul says you should mourn, which I, simply, uh, I think simply means here you should be contrite. You should be re repentant lest you too be judged for tolerating this sin. We'll see that more in, in the coming uh, week's text. And notice how mourning doesn't just produce some sort of emotional response, but it produces decisive action as well. What's the next line? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. What does that mean? Well, it means a couple of things. First, 
It means that contrary to what we might think, contrary to what we might feel, contrary to what culture might tell us, our personal sin is never private. Your sin always affects others. Sometimes that's very obvious. Sometimes it's very tangible. You drink, you drive, you hit someone else, and, uh, and certainly you can see that. Or you leave your spouse and kids, and that's certainly very obvious. Sometimes your sin very obviously affects others. But theologically, it always affects others if you're a believer. You have a personal relationship with Jesus. You do not have a private relationship with him. When you're saved out of sin, you're saved into community. You're saved into the church as a member of a body. Whether you're a member of a local church or not, you're a member of the church of God. And as a member of a body, a hand or a foot or a pancreas doesn't have the right to exist independently of the rest of the body. All right? So that's the first thing it means. Second, as a consequence of this corporate nature of your faith and the corporate nature of your sin, the church community bears this responsibility. We love to hide behind these live and let live, all right? It's none of your business, don't judge me, bro, sort of idea. And those might work in society as kind of this mantra of culture, but those have no sort of place in the church. Your sin is my business. My sin is your business, not because I'm your pastor, but because I'm your brother. We're members of the same body. We're members of the same family. So the church has a responsibility toward one another. It has a duty to remove this man. So what does it mean to remove him? Well, historically, this is called excommunication, which is the final stage of a process that is known historically as church discipline. And before we talk about what that means, in fact, we'll actually have a couple of weeks on this because the text will continue uh, this same theme. But before we talk about what that means, we need to deal with this misconception this cultural sort of presupposition that we have. And that, uh, that idea is that discipline is mean, discipline is unkind, discipline is unloving. In reality, the exact opposite is true. Again, this is another place where culture has redefined a term or a concept to make it more palatable or less palatable for us. When in reality, the exact opposite is true. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll see a bit more of the practical side of church discipline. But today, I just want to prepare our hearts for that practical matter by simply trying to prove this one point, And that is that discipline is good. Discipline is loving. Unless you understand that, you won't understand any of what 1 Corinthians 5 is going to be talking about. All right? So discipline isn't mean. It isn't unkind, it isn't intolerant, it isn't abusive, it isn't unloving. Discipline is instead good and gracious and loving. And I want to show you that by walking through a handful of, uh, of context where Scripture shows us that discipline is good, gracious, and loving. So three contexts. The first one, a parent disciplines the, uh, the children he or she loves. Second, God disciplines those whom he loves. And finally, a church disciplines those whom they love. Love. So first, a father or mother disciplines those whom he or she loves. Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod hates the son, but he who, is, who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Proverbs 19, 18, discipline your son for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. So parental discipline isn't evil. It isn't unkind. It isn't abusive. It isn't even morally neutral. It's positively righteous and good. In fact, notice how a lack of discipline is described as hatred, as indifference, as neglect. The parent who disciplines their kid is not the one who's abusive. The one who doesn't discipline their kid is the one who's actually abusive. Now, the point of this text isn't parental discipline, the point of 1 Corinthians 5, but we actually have a blog that's, uh, that's coming out in the next uh, month or so that will help give a theology of family discipline. My point here is simply to show you one context where Scripture is explicitly clear that discipline is a loving thing. Another context is that God disciplines those whom He Loves. This is an extended passage from Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. It says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline 
that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Revelation 3.19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. So yet again, you see the same theme. Our flesh, culture, the world assumes that discipline has to be mean-spirited, it has to be unkind, it has to be cruel, but over and over again, Scripture rebukes our assumptions. In fact, Romans 1 explicitly says that God's wrath is revealed not by disciplining us, but His wrath is revealed by actually turning people over to their desires, that God's wrath is giving them what they actually want. Now, take those two contexts, parental discipline and God's discipline of those whom He loves, and imagine that those are lenses or apply them like a filter to the general theme, the general concept, the general topic of discipline, and then take that and view the topic of church discipline through that filter, and you'll see that a church disciplines not those whom we hate, but those whom we love. A church that fails to practice discipline isn't only arrogant, as we saw earlier, but it's also cruel, it's unkind, it's unloving, As with arrogance, the world attempts to redefine the word love in a way that actually contradicts the meaning of love. Therefore, for a church to fail to exercise discipline means at least one of two things. It means, number one, that it doesn't actually understand this uh, presupposition, this this, uh, philosophical, theological point that discipline is loving. It's so imbibed of these cultural assumptions that that idea that discipline is actually loving and good and gracious and kind is completely foreign. That's the first thing. Or, and this is more likely, it just simply means that a church might understand that, but it's simply too afraid or too apathetic or too calloused or too indifferent to actually demonstrate that love by practicing discipline. But uh, churches that actually love their people will exercise discipline. And they'll do so even in the final stages of discipline, which includes removing someone from the community. What does that look like? We'll see it over the next two weeks, but we get a preview in verses three through five. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are delivered this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now this is just one long run-on sentence in Greek. It's a bit of a grammatical maze. There's some really confusing linguistic twists and turns, but really the overall point is easy enough. And before we get to that though, let me just briefly mention this little thing that could be confusing. What does he mean by absent in body, but present in spirit? Don't get hung up on that. This isn't some weird mystical Jedi spirit projection, Gnostic thing that's going on. It's just a metaphorical way of saying that although he's not there in person, he's still with them in a sense. In particular, when this letter is being read, Paul's apostolic authority is spiritually present. His presence is mediated through the written word and through the Holy Spirit. So with that in mind, there are a few things that I want you to see here in this text. First, I want you to notice the role of community. Notice that it says when you are assembled. Why is that important? Because it helps to see that church discipline isn't just something that the elders do or something that the staff do. It's something that the church does. It's the role of the assembly. It's the role of the gathering, the ecclesia, the church, the corporate body and bride of Christ. It's the goal or or the role of the church to exercise discipline for the glory of God, for the health of the church and for the good of the unrepentant sinner. And speaking of the good of the unrepentant sinner, notice the goal here, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That's the goal, his ultimate reconciliation. As we work through in the previous verses, discipline is loving. 
It's aimed toward a higher end, a greater good than just temporal happiness. Discipline isn't merely punitive, it's also restorative. It's built upon a foundation of hope, hope for repentance and for restoration. So how does the church exercise discipline in this context? Paul says to deliver the man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. So what does it mean to deliver someone to Satan? And what does the destruction of the flesh mean? Well, first, what does it mean to deliver to Satan? We see similar language that's actually used in, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, where Paul says that he has handed over two guys named Hymenaeus and Alexander, and he's handed them over to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme. You see, again, that restorative sort of element, so that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, this might seem a weird way of talking. Why are we talking about handing people over to Satan? But it makes sense if you actually remember that throughout Scripture, Satan is portrayed as being the ruler of the world, all right? If, uh, for instance, in, uh, in John 14, Jesus is talking uh, and he calls Satan the ruler of this world or, or Paul in, uh, in, I think it's 2 Corinthians, calls him the God of this world. So all of humanity, biblically, is going to be divided into two groups, all right? Historically, in the Old Testament, it was divided into Israel versus the nations. That's no longer the case today. Instead, it's divided into those who are of the kingdom of the world and those who are of the kingdom of God. And those two kingdoms are mutually exclusive. It isn't like Venn diagrams that kind of overlap. Those are mutually exclusive. You can't have dual citizenship. Once you become a citizen of the kingdom of God, you have to renounce your citizenship in the kingdom of the world. Everyone is born into the kingdom of the world But through regeneration and through faith, you become a citizen of the kingdom of God and you therefore renounce your citizenship in the previous uh, kingdom. So what Paul is saying is that in removing someone from the church, the community hands that person over to Satan, the ruler of the world. They're put out of the church. They're put back into the realm of, uh, into the, realm of the world and uh, where they're chastised, they're tormented with the hope of repentance. They're isolated. So we see that hope in the next phrase, the destruction of the flesh. What does that mean? A couple more things, then we'll get to a little bit of something that's a little bit lighter. Well, there's two basic schools of thought as it relates to the destruction of the flesh. The first is that Paul is using the word flesh here to refer to the body. The second is that flesh refers to uh, the spirit, spiritual presence, the spiritual power of sin. So if flesh means body, then the destruction of the flesh means that you're to kill this person. I don't think in any way that is what Paul is, uh, is saying here. Although you do see in, uh, in uh, the, the Bible, there are examples of times where people are disciplined by death, not by the church community that's doing that, but for example, Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts, or even in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, we'll read about people that are taking communion in some sort of unworthy manner and they are struck down and die. So sometimes people will say, that's what the destruction of the flesh means, that you turn them over to Satan, you put them out into the world, and then Satan kills that person. I don't think at all that is Paul's point. I think instead, he's using flesh the way that he always uses flesh in his letters. That is to refer to the spiritual power of sin. And so I think Paul's using the term the way that he always does. That this Corinthian man is unrepentantly, he's habitually sinning. And so I think what Paul is saying is that by turning this man over to Satan, not the man, but the sin will be put to death. I think that's uh, the the phrase. Think about uh, the concept of timeout, right? Anybody ever get put in timeout as a kid? Like three of you, that's it? Anybody ever get spanked as a kid? Yeah, man, when I was a kid, anybody could spank you. Strangers, didn't matter, right? (laughs) Now, I'm an introvert. Timeout didn't work for me, right? You put me in timeout as a kid, it would backfire. I'll be alone all day long. That's perfectly content. In fact, I'm probably going to intentionally disobey tomorrow so I can get more timeout, all right? That's not just true of pre-adolescent Jeff. That's true of adult Jeff as well because I'm not only an introvert, I'm also a parent of two pretty hyper kids. So I'd love a few minutes of peace and quiet. In fact, timeout is like, it's literally on my Father's Day wish list, all right? But you know who's not an introvert? And that is Zach. You lock Zach in his office, I don't know, an hour maybe? It's like a scene in Castaway or Lord of the Flies. All right, he's talking to volleyballs. He's sharpening sticks into spears and rubbing stuff on his face. 
All right, so take that theory of time out, at least as it applies to someone not like me, and that's kind of the theory of excommunication. The idea is that this form of discipline, by removing this person from the church, they're isolated, and that isolation is a form of discipline to bring about repentance and contrition. I think that's what Paul is saying here, that in removing someone from the fellowship of the church, this last resort, last ditch effort, this final step in the discipline process that's laid out in Matthew 18, which we've, uh, we've preached about before, that, that that unrepentant sinner would finally actually be grieved into repentance. This man who professes to be a believer would actually manifest that belief through repentance and thus be reconciled and restored to God and to the church. You have to understand, in the first century, this, there wasn't a church on every corner. You couldn't simply leave one church and go to another church. To be removed from the church was to be cut off from your community, oftentimes cut off from your family. In a sense, it was to lose your very identity. Unfortunately, that's not the way that most churches operate today. In fact, if we were to remove someone from Parkway, for instance, as we've tearfully had to do a couple of times over the past few years, I guarantee you there are dozens of other churches that would you know, wholeheartedly with arms wide open, welcome that member into their body. I can make that guarantee because we've called other churches before. We've let them know someone is under discipline. Here's the reason. We're not being, uh, we're not being abusive. We're not being mean. We're not being unkind. This is not questionable. This is not gray. And what's their response? Anybody want to guess? We're just going to give them grace. We're just going to give them grace. Again, it's this redefinition of a word where it doesn't actually have any of the biblical content, which reveals these three huge uphill battles that we face in our culture. So I want to wrap up by talking about those. The first is individualism. If we're going to understand, if we're going to appreciate, if we're going to apply discipline, which is something we'll talk about over the next three weeks, then we have to understand the role of individualism. And we have to confess that. We have to repent of that. This individualism that says, I am my own. Not only do I not want to be rebuked or corrected by others, but I also feel no responsibility to to correct or rebuke others. This kind of live and let live sort of idea. That's the first thing that has to die. The second is this distorted view of discipline. We've talked about this a number of times because this is so foundational, this is so important if we're going to actually be able to understand what the the Bible is saying and not a caricature of it. This distorted view of discipline that says that correction, rebuke, discipline, those kinds of things are arrogant, they're intolerant, they're unloving unless or until we understand that the exact opposite is true, that discipline is grace, that discipline is love, that discipline is kindness, will ironically end up hurting the very people that we claim to love. Like the Corinthians, we'll end up boasting in our foolishness all the while calling it wisdom. So that's the second uphill battle that we face. The third uphill battle is this cultural serious diminishing of the horrors of sin. If sin isn't really that bad, we won't take it all that seriously. So I'll end with this illustration. As a parent... There are tons of things that my kids do that I don't love. I shared a while back about my son using this big ladle to drink from the toilet. Not sure how you feel about toilet water in your house. Maybe that's perfectly acceptable. Not in my house. I'd prefer for my kid not to have a literal potty mouth, all right? But at the end of the day, I also know it's probably not that big of a deal, assuming that the toilet is actually clean, right? The worst that might happen is he gets a little sick. It's more gross than it actually is dangerous. But there are other things that are much more serious. For instance, the other day, this same son, he got a hold of some almond extract and he managed to get it open and he managed to drink some. Well, what's the big deal with that? Well, if you know anything about almond extract, you know what the big deal with that is because almond extract is about 90% alcohol. Right? So we had to call poison control and then you have to just wait and hope that he hadn't ingested too much because straight alcohol isn't the kind of thing I want to give my two-year-old, right? Fortunately, he didn't drink much because it isn't merely gross, it's actually dangerous, right? Now, as you can imagine, our parental response, my wife and I, to those situations 
is going to differ greatly, right? He can still generally play with a ladle. We just don't let him play with a ladle and the toilet at the same time, right? That's not a good combination. But we don't even let him touch the almond extract. The reason I say that is because I think a lot of Christians tend to treat sin like drinking from the toilet. It's gross, but it's not all that dangerous, rather than what it really is, which is drinking poison. And if that's the case, we tend to underreact. We tend to underreact uh, react to sin in our own life. We tend to underreact to sin in the life of our fellow believers. And that's what happened in Corinth, and that's what happens in churches across the world. As long as we have this distorted view of sin, this diminished view of its severity, of its gravity, of its seriousness, we never understand or treasure discipline as we should, either as those enacting the discipline or those receiving the discipline. So over the next two weeks, we'll see this theme of church discipline further developed. And my hope is that by God's grace, we would progressively be awakened to the dangers of sin and to the goodness of discipline. Until then, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I just confess I don't love being rebuked. That I hear the words that, that uh, faithful are the wounds of, of a friend and I believe that intellectually and yet I don't believe it deep down. That I don't want to be corrected. I don't want to be rebuked. And I don't want to correct and I don't want to rebuke others. That I'm oftentimes afraid. I'm afraid of the loss of relationship or I'm afraid of what they'll think of me or whatever it might be. And I know that it's not just me. And so I pray, Lord, for us collectively as a body that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that would believe your word and believe that discipline is good and loving and that we might therefore not only hear your word but be doers of it as well. We pray these things because you're good and you do good. So we ask in Christ's name, amen.